Not too long ago, I ended up doing a very long video discussing a YouTuber who I used to really like, and now I don't anymore. And more specifically, I talked about the fact that my dislike for him is so sort of present in my motivations that I find it harder to enjoy uh, specific subgenres of content that he basically defined. That being discussion videos written through the guise of a character, and extensive lore being associated with the YouTube channel. And one of the first comments I ended up consistently getting on this was, But Quentin, what about Filthy Frank? And that was a name I hadn't heard in a very long time. This topic has always been something that's sort of always been on the radar of Fallen Titans, and there's always been a few reasons why it's a good idea or a bad one. For one, when I first started this series, I had a secret private goal where I wanted every episode to sort of have a different reason that a YouTuber lost their fame. This quickly became unrealistic when the algorithm became the consistent reason every single time, but I've never really gotten to talk about a YouTuber who amicably decided to end their series at a natural point, because it's not a thing that really happens a lot on YouTube. But the other side of things was that uh, I know people get very upset when I cover topics that they don't personally believe are Fallen Titans. And furthermore, uh, people very much literally seem to worship Filthy Frank as if he was this god. And usually on this show, I like to criticize content through a modern lens, and I felt like for the longest time, that was something the internet could not handle with this particular creator. But even at the risk of pissing the entire internet off, I have to admit that revisiting Frank's content has been a really surreal experience, because it represents a certain brand of videos that I sort of gradually stopped watching, as I had real-world experiences that moved me away from that kind of stuff. You know what I mean, that certain brand of EdgeTube content, where, you know, the, the speaker comes on and they're acting all sporadic and wacky, and half of the time the joke will be that they just say a racial slur, but then edit the video in such a way that it just keeps rolling without really addressing it, making a juxtaposition between that shocking moment and the YouTuber deciding to just not make a big deal out of it. Stick with me, because I swear this part of the video has a point, and I'm going to get back to praising Joji and his work. When I was 17, I thought EdgeTube was incredibly subversive and hilarious, but then I turned 19 or 20, and the specific situation happened. Basically, I had a friend that was two years younger than me, and he had friends that were two years younger than him. So what ended up happening one day is I went to hang out with him to go to, like, a, a town event, and he ended up inviting his friends, and they sort of gave us a ride. So it ended up happening that I was hanging out with a bunch of 16-year-olds for no good reason. And it turned out they really liked saying the gamer word. So this group of 16-year-olds were driving around town with them, and they keep saying the gamer word, like, over and over again, like it's their favorite pastime. And eventually, we get to a red light at a four-way intersection. This is the center of our little town. Um, we are surrounded by cars, you know, there's a sidewalk right by us, people walk around here all the time. It's a very busy place. And one of them says, Hey, what if we rolled the windows down and just screamed? You know, the N-word. And I said, <laughs> Don't do that. And then they did it. And so the driver and the person in the passenger seat, they are screaming one of the worst racial slurs in the world at everyone around us, pedestrians, other cars right next to us at the four-way intersection, and I'm just like lowering myself down into this car I already barely fit into, in the back seat, just trying to be like, I hope no one sees me with these fucking idiots. And it's experiences like that, which I've had too many of, that really turned me away from the edge tubers I used to love. Because at best, that content reminds me of experiences like that, and at the worst, it encourages people to act like that. Hell, you know, when my channel started out, I, I uh, really liked these channels to the extent that I would put comedy like that in my videos. Uh, no matter the type, occasionally I would just say something ridiculously offensive, and I would do it because I would think that it was so offensive that it transcended anyone taking it seriously, and people would just laugh at how ridiculous a statement it would be. But in reality, 
now that time has set in, I wonder that instead of making people laugh at saying something that outrageous, that I've help normalize really horrible people saying things like that, and if I've unwillingly helped them spread hatred in that way. Think of it like this. A couple weeks ago, I decided to shave my beard. Now, this is something I do periodically. It, it, it's just, you know, part of the cycle. And I thought it'd be funny for just a few days to leave a handlebar mustache. And now it's been a while and I've continued to shave around the handlebar mustache. After a while, any of the irony that I was doing this for has sort of evaporated, and I've just become a guy with the handlebar mustache. What if one of my viewers decides that they like this look and that they want to grow a handlebar mustache? I've made handlebar mustaches seem normal to a dangerously impressionable group of young people, and in doing so, I've unintentionally helped spread one of the truest evils in the world. So to recap, I'm not saying in the slightest that edge tubers are hashtag cancelled, but merely that negative experiences that I personally have had in the real world have made it harder for me to enjoy those videos, and as a creator they've made me question what the consequences of my actions are, regardless of my intentions. But I think Filthy Frank is the exception to some extent. For one, I think his comedic timing was perfect, and you could tell he had a lot of talent beyond the shock humor. And for two, his content was created not to encourage or take part in edgelord culture, but to make fun of edgelords and reactionaries, and how absolutely stupid they usually end up coming across. I never had to worry about Frank's intentions. I never had to look for clues that he might secretly be a crypto-fascist. I knew that he was a regular guy playing an edgy person in order to make fun of edgy people, even if the most vocal parts of his audience were equally terrible human beings and did not understand what he was trying to do. EdgeTube was like internet content vomit. And the Filthy Frank show was the beautiful cake that got baked out of it, despite all of the flaws. I don't know how to transition no good. Let's play the cartoon intro. Come in! It's my sentient copy of The Legend of Frosty the Snowman from all the way back in my second review! How you doing, man? Yeah, he, uh... He doesn't really talk, he just, uh... He just sort of floats there. Doesn't pay rent, either. All right, thanks for stopping by, man. <laughs> that guy sucks. Before we begin, I want to quickly mention that this video is sponsored once again by privacy.com. I recently had a big security scare where at the end of it, I had to get a new bank card. And I was really happy that I had used uh, privacy on so, so many of my online services because it's, it's linked directly to my account. So I didn't have to replace it anywhere online, even though I got a new card. Once I realized that, and I started thinking about, you know, all those little nuggets I've been telling people about, you know, privacy is good for this and this and that, I was like, yeah, I think I'm going to use privacy to set up uh, all the cards that I do have to replace. And it's been great for keeping track of all my uh, online subscriptions, just having it all flat right there in front of my face, what I have, you know, what I could get rid of. And not only will you have all of that, but if you go to my link, privacy.com slash Quentin, you will be given an extra $5 off your first purchase. That's free $5 to spend anywhere you want to on the internet. Uh, once again, that's privacy.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. On August the 5th, 2011, George Miller, known as Joji to his friends, uploaded the very first episode of The Filthy Frank Show to his YouTube channel, Disaster Music, where he would find a home for it for many years to come. 
Let's take a look. I'd like to share with you a little story. Uh, I tend to have explosive diarrhea, like shit just flies all over the place. I, I, went, I sat down to take a shit. Uh, of course, diarrhea just exploded all over the place. I noticed there was no toilet paper left. I decided to go get some of the toilet paper. When I got back to the toilet, I realized that I, I, I was dripping shit. I was dripping shit from my ass. Scalding hot take. Early Filthy Frank is terrible. And it's not just not good because of the production value or the lack of anything funny, but because it represents everything that Filthy Frank grew not to be as time moved on. If I rubbed the Pakistani kids' diarrhea all over my body, I would look like the Jersey Shore cast. Every time I watch it, I just grow a new vagina. Yo, 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 I'm black! I'd personally shove a big branch up my ass. So in Frank's early content, he'll sit in front of a camera, and he'll go on long, verbose rants, and they're not really funny, but he'll interject into them sort of things that he believes to be shockingly offensive, but in actuality, they just come across as really lazy Mad Libs. It reminds me a lot of, like, early angry video game nerd knockoffs. I had to get out of that locker room, it just tasted like, it, t it just smelled like shit. Just shit, it was filthy shit. If I took a shit, and if I grabbed that shit, and if I threw it at another piece of shit, it would smell like that shit, but ten times worse. If a Papua New Guinean guy took a giant Papua New Guinean shit, the Papua New Guinean shit would not smell as bad as how the locker room smelled, which was absolute locker room shit. On top of that, it just smelled like football players' dicks. Dicks! Lots of dicks and shit. He tended to include very shocking racist or homophobic interjections as sometimes he would exercise in playful fat shaming. Uh, it's not entertaining, not because I find it offensive, but because it's not heavily challenging. Ray William Johnson could have written these videos. Are you watching Jersey Shore? You're gay! You're gay, bro! You're gay! I was just watching Pokemon! What is the deal with the N-word? I think one of the best ways to understand Frank as a character and what Joji really intended with him is to look at Francis of the Filth, which is a lore book uh, written by Miller and is also the last piece of media he ever released in the Filthy Frank franchise. In Chapter 2, Miller writes of Frank's origins. Frank is found as a fetus-like child in the sewers of Indonesia. Within a few hours of being discovered by the townsfolk, he is speaking complex Aramaic and is writing uh, detailed equations on the wall with whatever he has at hand in a sewer. He passes through numerous different homes and different people taking care of him until eventually he's discovered by the Indonesian government, at which point he's experimented on and then he is discovered by the Axis powers who take him to Japan because Filthy Frank was born during the Second World War, apparently. So America bombs Japan down the war. It's described exactly as seriously as it was in real life with like real historical information on how horrible it was. This is kind of weird because Hitler is treated like a joke. Anyways, Frank is brought up by a shattered corporation who are secretly the last remaining fragment of the Nazi government and the corporation secretly plans to reunite the Axis powers and defeat the Allies despite the war being over, and this is the group that raises Frank from birth. And man, if you have not seen a Filthy Frank video, you must think this is some weird shit, and honestly, even if you've seen every Filthy Frank video, this is still a really weird book. Anyway, so the reason I'm setting all that up is because we have a really good description here of how Frank's mentality adapts to essentially being raised by Nazis, and this pretty much described in my eyes how Joji viewed his character throughout all of these years. Frank's secluded upbringing gave him a peculiar perspective on the world. He tended to see people and events in extremes. He divided folks into creators and consumers, leaders and followers, thinkers and dumbasses, and bullies and their prey. No one really sat in between any of these paradigms. People were either one or the other, and once they were one, it was virtually impossible to change to the other. Frank saw himself as the consummate creator, leader, thinker bully in almost any environment he found himself in. This one paragraph sets into stone most of Frank's character throughout the entire channel's run. He believes himself to be the ultimate alpha Chad, but in reality, he's nothing more than a whiny bitch boy. Basically like any nationalist. So the main thing we have to understand about Filthy Frank is that he doesn't exist, like Big Bird or Steve from the Blue's Clues. 
Filthy Frank was essentially an experiment into creating a character who was obscenely unlikable and pathetic, while still being funny. Although, obviously, that factor didn't really work at first. But I think a more interesting aspect to discuss is why it was like this, and why it changed. To suddenly leap forward in the history of the show, Joji eventually started doing a series of videos where he would wear a pink jumpsuit and would attempt to sing along to music. Eventually, this was retconned into being a standalone character who lives with Frank. What the hell? Get out! Get out, you sick prick! Pink Guy would soon gain new friends, as Joji's acquaintances would find their own costumes and the group would film their adventures running around Japan as these characters. One day, Joji and his friends decided to record a comedic dance video. They would call it The Harlem Shake. Do the Harlem Shake. Today the video has over 60 million views. If you were around at the time, you might not have seen it, but you certainly saw a video imitating it. Maybe from a popular TV show. Maybe from your friends or your teachers. Today, it's surreal to think that a Filthy Frank video found large-scale appeal like that, where it became so well-known to everyone that people in Harlem were actually annoyed about being asked about it. But the stranger effect it had was turning Joji from a shit poster with a select audience of few to an influential person with a massive audience. And that transition wasn't immediate, but I think growing a real audience is what made him change his mind about how to approach showing this character and this sort of content. One of the main reasons I find it hard to find charm in the character's racist rants in early videos is that I'm looking at these as creations which have been seen by millions of people. But that's not really what they were made to be. These videos were made by Joji under the expectation that 100 views was pretty good for him. His experience was probably that he would make it, show it to his close friends, and then they would laugh about how horrible this persona had ended up becoming. And that's the relationship a lot of audience members like myself had with Frank. It was one-to-one. -one, me and him. But the issue is that YouTube content doesn't exist in a vacuum. While context and intentions are important to understanding the meaning and purpose of media, the repercussions of your actions are equally valid to discuss. Let's jump back to the Harlem Shake. The Harlem Shake video is something that is potentially funny by itself. It's silly, they're doing weird dances, it's worth the few seconds that it takes up in your day. But the repercussion of that is that now everyone and their dog started copying it without the context or really the explicit irony. Suddenly, everyone on the internet has a handlebar mustache. Con los terroristas. That's enough! Internet! What the fuck have you done?! I think the same can be said of a lot of these early videos. They're potentially funny if you watch them on a standalone basis and accept them in a vacuum as a parody of the sort of person Frank is. But when you see all of it copied by millions of people who perhaps don't see it in that same way, or admire it as if it's sincere, it becomes... Is annoying the right word? A lot of Frank's early content is either unlisted or private. There are backups of most of these videos on other channels, but that's not true for all of them. And I think what this primarily represents is Joji's standards for how he needed to present this weird pathetic jackass started changing over time, to the point that he started to regret some of these early videos. It's sort of like when a kid's show will show monsters attacking people, and that's totally okay. But you can't show someone getting stabbed with scissors, because kids are stupid, and they'll actually do that. Frank basically had this journey where he started to find ridiculous things for his character to do that were both funny, but less imitatable. And I think that's the main thing that helped him evolve into a better creator. A great example of a video where Frank had more clearly hit his stride is his video, I Hate Vegans. The reason it's so perfect is that he's a horrible human being in it, but in a way that no normal person could not see as satire. I believe that animals have no souls. You know, they're just fucking dumb. Like, look at these fucking animals. You expect an afterlife for these motherfuckers? Listen, I understand that this is the real fucking world, and animals are sacrificing their free will and their bodies for my eating pleasure. But I blissfully turn a blind eye, because that's, that's what humans do. And humans are fucking shitty. What? Another thing that separates older Filthy Frank content from earlier stuff was that he clearly eventually realized that his words were having an influence on his audience no matter the motivation. And so he would clearly begin using his character to represent some of his actual real-world views. Look, kids, smoking is bad. You shouldn't do it. These producers are right. 
This organization is right, you shouldn't smoke. Gender's a social construct, bitch! I Hate Vegans also features a key ingredient which became quite famous with his content, the prank video. Essentially, Joji would appear as one of his characters in public and would begin acting outrageous, while recording the reactions of people around him. When he first started doing this, it really didn't work. And the reason is that he filmed it in a country where people were prone to interact and take part, and thus the whole thing felt pretty mean-spirited. When the act truly became perfect was when Frank moved to New York City. Now, I visited New York a few years ago just for over a week, mainly because I wanted to understand what it was like to live in a place like that. And one lesson that I learned right away was that when you're in New York City, you see some weird shit. As someone raised in the Midwest, I was prone to react like a human being, but you can't do that because it encourages the weird people. By the end of the first week, you're just a solid rock. Nothing phases you anymore. This is why these prank videos work. Because the people Frank acts out in front of rarely end up acting as if he even exists within the same reality as they do. They just ignore him, like it's not even the worst thing they've seen that day. And this forces Joji to focus more on himself being the butt of the segment. <sighs> <sighs> Ravioli, ravioli, what's in the pocket only? This phases segments like these away from being mean-spirited pranks and instead towards being performance art. It's a subtle nuance that really took years for him to find, and is also why people who have tried to mimic what he does have just ended up being assholes. So to again clarify my position, because I feel like people are really gonna take me out of context here. When I say Filthy Frank's early content was bad, it's not that I'm offended. It's more that it's just really lazy and boring and lacking substance. And that really stands out when you hit around 2014 and Frank's content just becomes pure concentrated gold. Filthy Frank, anime hunter. Filthy Frank, anime hunter. Filthy Frank, anime hunter. Filthy Frank. Filthy Frank is occasionally described as one of the greatest YouTubers of all time by a select few, and while his rants and or commentary videos were certainly a big help in keeping his series running, it's his skit-focused comedy that has gained him a lot more clout. In short, it's his best shit. I think my favorite video of his is E.T. 2, which features Frank discovering a crash-landed alien who has never been able to find friends on Earth due to being feared, which causes Frank to promise to show him a good time. But instead of them having wholesome adventures, Frank introduces him to a world of drugs, partying, and sex. We can take over the crack game. We can sell the coke on our own. Content like this is why people watched. It's brilliant. It's also interesting to note how visually interesting E.T. 2 is. I think this is a point in his content where he started to realize that he sort of needed to take the shit out of shit posting in that he wanted to make something that was actually satisfying to make and to look at, and that really improves the output that he makes at this point. But no matter what you ended up watching on the channel, there was always some element that tied it all together, little pieces that essentially rewarded those who were paying attention. This is not a threat, a promise. One of the most essential pieces to Joji's videos was how he balanced his half-hearted commentary with his channel's lore. <laughs> but said lore was built up so slowly and ingrained so subtly that a lot of people didn't even notice it was there. But I would argue that the lore in The Filthy Frank Show was the most important element because it gave the series a purpose. In the same way that we look for meaning in the real world to connect the purpose of one day to the next, Joji supplied the same thing to his audience and essentially rewarded them for being particularly diligent with what they watched. Canonically, the first event in the lore playlist of Frank events takes place when Pink Guy is assaulted by Red Dick and a muscular man known as Prometheus. <laughs> Horrified by this, he makes a deal to summon the Dark Lord known as Chin Chin who arrives out of the bushes and helps Pink Guy fight off Prometheus. Some videos later, Chin Chin arrives at Frank's apartment and begins harassing him, telling him that he has owed sacrifices for helping Pink Guy before. Frank is unable to supply this, and thus secondary cast member Salamander Man is pulled into Chin Chin's clutches, sucked into the cupboard that the characters use to travel the Omniverse. 
A quick side note, out of all the different side characters who are just Joji in different costumes, Lemon Man is the best one, because his main role is to have an existential meltdown. God, I'm a lemon! The group eventually finds Chin Chin and Salamander Man, and use footage of sacrifices sent in by fans to get Salamander Man back from him. A rumor I've heard floating around is that while he did the sacrifices gimmick the first couple years, he had to stop because there was a rumor that someone had accidentally burned down a forest. It should also be said that the movement of time in this series has been consistently measured in something called chromosomes, a joke that was really funny in 2013. Chromosomes also tend to be used as a power source and as the Omniverse's main form of currency, something which made absolute sense in the year $94.17. It's often illustrated the characters have to use up their chromosomes to get from one world to the next. In the lore book, it's specifically said that Frank is one of the only humans who has the ability to multiply his chromosomes. It's also revealed that this is why so many great forces like Chin Chin go after him week after week. His ability to create chromosomes makes him a target for forces hungry for power, who want to drain him of these. Chin Chin is believed by most all forces in the many realms to be the mythical ultimate god. However, this is clearly put into doubt by his hunger for chromosomes from people like Frank. What does God need with a starship? Despite this, he still holds ultimate power, and Frank has many confrontations with him. The biggest twist in the Filthy Frank cinematic universe took place in early 2015, when Frank again was challenged by Chin Chin to find sacrifices to sustain him. Once again, Chin Chin wasn't pleased, and ordered Frank to give up Pink Guy as sacrifice. Frank refused, and as punishment, Chin Chin banished him to the rice fields. One could argue this moment signifies a great evolution for Frank's character, where he's overall willing to make self-sacrifices and has overall become much less of a literal Nazi. However, you could equally make the argument that the lore elements where Frank is portrayed as this ultimate heroic protagonist god have nothing to do with the parts where he's being a racist asshole. So the week after Chin Chin banished Frank, this is when he released his first video about vegans, which seems to be breaking with the storyline. This was all explained in the next episode, which showed Frank lost between realms and trying to find some way to track the coordinates which would lead him home. The seemingly immortal and wise gatekeeper advises him to smell his way there. Pink Guy and Red Dick are then seen cooking sriracha shrimp to the tune of Meme Machine, and Frank enters the room, smelling the shrimp. However, then a scene appears of Frank, still lost, finally smelling home for the first time. A simple voiceover explains the discrepancy. You're an imposter. There are now two versions of Frank, one with regular classes who is traveling between realms, universes, and omniverses, hoping each time that his next leap will be the leap home, and the stupid colored glasses Frank, an imposter who is trying to steal Frank's life in his absence. So the filthy Frank who most people ended up meeting when the channel really started to blow up, the filthy Frank who knew many other YouTubers and was appearing on their channels, and the filthy Frank who was making some of the best content of the entire channel's run, that filthy Frank was actually a bad guy in the lore. In retrospect, it probably should have been obvious that the regular Frank returning would have eventually marked the end of the series. So this all builds up to the two biggest events in the channel's history, at least to me the Filthy Frank Lore movie, and the final Pink Guy album. The Frank Lore movie is the perfect take on his style of storytelling, because it manages to be heavily visually captivating, and yet it still feels comfortable breaking and being shoddy in a sort of charming way. Oh no, Chin Chin brought one of the Tap Brothers. They're notoriously wanted in the Omniverses. I don't know if I can take him alone. It's gonna be one hell of a fight. It's this great mix where the film is trying to appeal to the audience's expectations of this being some epic masterpiece, while still stepping back and reminding everyone that this all happened because some guy made a show where a bunch of his friends were dressing up in jumpsuits. Fuck is this? Who's he? Who the fuck is? Who the fuck is this? Specifically, the reveal of the real Frank returning has always been a really memorable sequence. It's really satisfying to see this character born in filth almost be reborn in this bright aura as he arrives to save his friends. Also, I've always found the shots of Pink Guy crucified to the tree to be really cool. They must have had a lot of fun scouting out locations like this. One of the most notable things about the video is that Fake Frank, who at this point has been running the channel for years, is consistently presented as nothing more than a lesser Frank not even worth taking seriously. 
in some way, you could argue fake Frank represents a version of Frank who wouldn't change, and it's only natural that his defeat would be more of a whimper than a bang. Also, E.T. 2 shows up again and helps them fight. I thought that was a fun nod. Listen, kids, being edgy is okay. But the same ten jokes in a row, that's not okay. Okay, okay. Clearly one of the biggest struggles of the Filthy Frank show was that Joji was a regular guy who was playing this outrageous thing. And I think over time he started asking questions to himself. Questions like, when does this end? As early as 2015, Joji was openly talking about his deep desire to move on to other projects, where he didn't have to be a consistently edgy person, and that he did have comedic interests outside of that subspace. But there are things at play outside of his boredom with the material that took prevalence here. A few years before he retired, Joji briefly uploaded a video which featured him arriving in the apartment of Filthy Frank which causes Frank to freak out, believing he's going to be put down like a dog. And then Joji breaks character and just talks about some serious stuff. Joji had been diagnosed with a condition where he would break into stress-induced seizures, and doing this show where he was constantly putting strain on his body, his voice, and his personality was actually starting to affect his health. Now, there's no real archive of how the fanbase reacted to this, but the impression I got is that a community wired to think that people who care are losers didn't take this seriously, and basically were upset that he was breaking character and threatening to end his show. And after a couple days, Joji privated the video and for years after that made his real appearances outside of the Frank character very scarce. There clearly was some worry that he had grown this massive audience who wanted him as Filthy Frank and really weren't prepared to accept him just as Joji. I was under the impression that, you know, that was, that was my, that was my pinnacle. It's your peak. This is my opus. It's your opus. <laughs> this is my opus. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna be yelling on the internet, making semi-valid points here and there. You know, I thought that was, like, I was depressed that that was gonna be it. But really started when he first figured out that playing Frank was causing him physical harm, I think there was this plan set into place to figure out how to transition into ending this series. And what ended up helping out was the in-narrative introduction of Pink Guy as an artist. Uh, uh, Shit! They call me the meme machine. I catch the memes, I spread the memes, I eat the memes, I shit the memes. Why has God abandoned us? Help me. Pink Guy albums slap so hard. I listen to them all the time, specifically Pink Season, which is so good that it, it essentially serves as a standalone project separate from the Filthy Frank show. But the thing is, I can never put it on for my friends because while half of the songs are sort of like complete unironic jammers, the other half either sound like they were actually recorded by Pink Guy, or they're just so strange and they need such explicit context that it's hard to show it to someone without including an essay alongside it. There's a lot of the singer playing an offensive character and saying certain opinions while also representing the author's true opinions through that guy's. Nickelodeon Girls, for instance, is about the narrator being upset that when he was younger, Nickelodeon had a lot of, like, 19-year-old stars that it sort of openly sexualized, and, and the singer is upset that now everyone on the channel is uh, preteens, and the entire song is written towards Dan Schneider, essentially begging him to go back to his own ways, and uh, if you take it at face value, it's pretty disgusting, but in actuality, it reads much more like a criticism of the sort of content that Dan Schneider put out which is a sentiment that is pretty obviously ahead of its time. It's a great mix of appealing to the audience's expectations while still saying something. I think the strangest song among them is called Fried Noodles. The song is presented pretty normal from the start. Joji is in character, bragging about his success online and uh, dunking on the haters and saying offensive things, but the entire time he lacks any real sufficient energy. And then it gets to the chorus, which sounds like this. I live in a constant state of fear and misery. Do we miss me anymore? <laughs> and I don't even notice when it hurts anymore, 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 anymore. 
By the final lines of the song, he's essentially telling his audience as directly as he possibly can that he stopped finding it fun to do his YouTube channel anymore. They call my dick a mammoth, you salty, you got a micro D. Classic penis joke inserted with appropriate timing, cause if I ain't got a penis line, I ain't dining. No homo, but seriously, I'm getting faded, and my life is like my vids, low budget and underrated. Kids, the only way to succeed is to chip away at the soul, and hope that by the time you get there, you ain't singing. I live in a constant state of fear and misery. One of the main takeaways from this album is that Joji clearly had a lot of real talent producing real music. And this clearly opened up the avenues for him to have a career switch, for him to do this new, exciting thing that wasn't slowly killing him. The final lore video we talked about earlier ended with the teaser that Chin Chin would return, and that Frank would have to defeat him once and for all. This clearly hinted that there was supposed to be some secondary conclusion to the series after this video. Sometime in the middle of 2017, a close associate of Joji announced on Reddit that there was a concrete plan to end the series, with two music videos, a lore book, and a Netflix original movie. And soon enough, later that year, we got two last videos. We got a lore book. But that Netflix movie was never announced. It seems to me that it's the most likely that it was something they tried to pitch, but they just didn't get it approved, so they dropped it. So just the fact that the Netflix movie was presumably going to exist at some point explains a lot of the eccentricities of Francis of the Filth, uh, at least to me. It reminds me of Fire Walk With Me, because Fire Walk With Me is like 50% lore that you only understand if you've seen all of Twin Peaks, and it's 50% set up that only makes sense if you've seen the sequel to Firewalk With Me, but they never made a sequel to Firewalk With Me, so half the movie just doesn't make sense and you don't understand why it's there. Uh, that's what this book is like. It's just like stuff gets introduced that has nothing to do with the lore and I presume was set up for the movie and it's never resolved in the book because he thought he was going to get to resolve it in the movie. And you know, I think the biggest example is the fact that Frank is raised by neo-Nazis in a post-World War II Japan, and he is an overt nationalist. It's not presented as a joke, so like his characteristics and his dark thoughts are explored, but not in a humorous way. He has deep racism, uh, he hates that other cultures are invading Japan, uh, he deeply hates that Americans are taking part in post-World War II Japan. He goes as far as to fantasize about murdering these invaders to his land and raping their wives. That's actually in the text. And it's not a joke, it's just like a thing we're cued into about what Frank is thinking. And the weirdest thing about the book is the moment he meets Pink Guy, it becomes a different text. He's written like a different character, suddenly he's this brilliant, you know, protagonist who's having these adventures who just occasionally will mention that he doesn't like black people. The book becomes unreadable at the point where he spends like a chapter each introducing lore characters who I thought they were in the lore because they didn't deserve to be in the lore and that was the joke. Like Lemon Man, Salamander Man, uh, Safari Man, and there's no jokes, <laughs> you know? And it's just really dull and I think the answer to why it's written like this is that Francis of the Filth is the kind of book where the joke is the fact that it got made and there are no other jokes. Uh, it is a 252 shit post and I, I just, I really wanted to like this because when I first started reading it, I, look, I was pulling out all these quotes that I wrote into the script and I, it was like cathartic to have this final experience I'd never heard about with this channel I used to love so much. But then it just became like utter garbage, and I was really sad. So let's pretend I didn't read that and go back to saying that Filthy Frank ended on a really good note. I think Filthy Frank works best as a project, which sounds like a sentence that is saying nothing, but stick with me, please. As a YouTuber, I am expected to live every moment on this platform like it's my life. This is me. It's a version of myself that I'm subconsciously building up for the camera, but it's me. 
and it's a mirror reflection of myself that is supposed to exist for all of time until I burn out or die. Filthy Frank wasn't like that. It was a specific character in a specific setting that had a bit of a bumpy start, but eventually found a quality that was so magnificent that it was like modern art. But it's almost sort of like a sitcom at that stage. There's a limited window where it's still going to be fresh, and if you overstay your welcome, that becomes your legacy. No matter the circumstances that led to it, I have found an immense amount of respect for Joji being willing to leave this moment in his life behind and to find mainstream success just as a regular artist. Ending his show when he did was the right thing to do, not because it was bad, but because it was still great. You know, I often do think about what's going to happen when I come to that point in my career. Because I know it's gonna happen one day. I always have that classic fantasy that the moment YouTube stops being fun, I, c I can just quit and get a real job as a writer or an actor, uh, as if this whole thing happening didn't even matter to those professions. This part of my life would become sort of a fun tidbit about my past and not what exclusively defines me. It'll never happen because I'm not talented at writing, directing, or acting, but it's good to know that someone's living the dream. And you know, I really do think I've come to a point in my life where I can look at the Filthy Frank show. I can look at all these characters, all these friendly faces, and I can learn to let go. It turns out I survived the fire! This video is brought to you once again by Privacy.com. Privacy, as you all probably remember, is a service that helps you create virtual cards to use instead of real ones. This is a perfect tool for security, as every time you make a purchase online, you risk your card info falling into the hands of merchants and their associates. With Privacy, you can avoid the swindlers and fully know that your information is secure. I was recently in a situation where I had to get a new bank card because of security reasons, and when I started setting everything back up online, all of the old things I said about privacy really started to come back to me, and I actually set up all my online payments through this service. On top of security, it's a great way to keep track of how much money I'm spending on subscription services and other places online. Using privacy is as simple as adding the add-on to your browser, pressing this little button when you're at checkout, and setting a card to your preferences with spending limits and the ability to freeze your card at will. Well, thanks to the politician's gene splicing, I can now heal myself almost instantly. And not only is this free, but if you use my personal link, privacy.com slash Quentin, you will have $5 taken off your first purchase. That's free $5 to use anywhere online and just in time for the holiday season. Once again, that's P-R-I-V-A-C-Y dot com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. Okay, so I know that this is going to be a long video always, but I wanted to make a big announcement here at the end. So December 7th is my birthday, I'm going to be turning 23, and I wanted to do something that would be both a gift to myself and a gift to you guys. So I have decided to make a special event on my Patreon. If you pledge $5 or more in between November the 30th at noon and December the 7th at 11 p.m., I will personally send you a postcard come the start of January. This deal will also apply to any person who is currently a Patreon supporter and moves up to any higher tier. So if you pledge $5 and you move up to $10, guess what? I'm sending you a postcard. And the first couple people to do this are going to get sent these cute little Fraser postcards that I bought online. These are really adorable, and I'm really excited to use these because they're so cute and I, you know, I'm going to be showing a bunch of photos of them, so if you want these, because they're great, you're going to have to go to my Patreon right away, starting November 30th at noon. Right away, because you want to be some of the, the quickest people to, to sign up and get these. you got to be quick, you got to be fast, you got to go to patreon.com slash qreview, and you got to do that, and you gotta, you got to get these postcards. My main tiers are $1 if you want to see my scripts and early uploads, and you're not going to get a postcard for that. $5, you're going to get your name in the credits in a crawl like this, $10, uh, this, this is a filler tier. It's basically if you want to give more, but you still want the same rewards as a $5 tier. $35 if you want a personal letter from me every single month, and $55 if you want a personal voice recording from me every single month. With that, 
I've been Quinn Kyle Hoover, and this has been Bonbon, bon, who doesn't like being held like that. And that's all you need. Sweet baby, you're gonna mess with my toys. Everyone loves the toy shelf. You can't mess with the toy shelf. Can I have a kiss? How do you hop on down?